Morning, guys. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about how at Facebook over the last year and a half or so, we re-engineered uh, the way in which we manage uh, our systems. But before I get into that, my pet peeve at conferences is people who stand up on stage and don't give me any concept of why I should listen to them talk about whatever it is they're going to talk about. So I'm going to do one really quick slide on why I think I'm qualified to give this talk. And at the end of the next slide, if you do not agree, feel free to leave and go get some coffee and I won't be offended. So I have configuration management experience uh, dating back to when I worked at Ticketmaster in the early to mid-2000s. Uh, we wrote a configuration management system called Spine that was a direct response to CF Engine 2. Uh, we wanted something that was going to be more dynamic. Uh, we had a very heterogeneous environment, uh, and CF Engine 2 wasn't going to meet our needs, so we wrote our own. This is back in the days before Puppet and Chef. Uh, and then uh, after we wrote that, I uh, saw another need, so I wrote a piece of software called Provision, which would do things like allocate VMs and, and find IP addresses and give you filer space and all of the things that were necessary for a system to be able to, to be kickstarted and actually get a configuration management system running. I also have some experience with scale. Uh, as I said, I worked at Ticketmaster, which when I left was running about 6,000 systems. Uh, and then I worked at Google, which had you know about an hour of systems. And then uh, I now work at Facebook, and we have lots of systems as well. And I will actually give you an idea of kind of what sort of scale Facebook has. Um, and the reality is that scaling configuration management has been my passion throughout the you know uh, 12 to 15 years of my career. So in order to talk about scaling configuration management, we have to define scale. We have to understand what sort of scale it is that we need. Uh, and every one of you is going to have a shop that has somewhat different scaling needs. And so there's a couple questions you need to ask yourself. And the first one of those questions is, uh, how many homogenous systems can you maintain? That may be a question you have to ask yourself. And if what you have is, say, an HPC-style cluster, where all of your machines are identical, you have a very unique problem. You may be able to use something like Ardist or Rsync, or the IBM guys wrote a really cool suite of utilities called XCAT, which is really good at tearing down systems and rebuilding them after, after jobs run. Um, you also may have to ask yourself how, how many heterogeneous systems can you maintain, uh, and my instinct is that the majority of the people in this room have this problem to, to solve. And heterogeneous systems uh, are a unique problem on a variety of fronts. You have some stuff that's going to be in common amongst all of your systems. You have some stuff that's going to be in common amongst similar types of systems or similar hardware profiles or whatever. And then you have all of these other things that are different that you have to somehow track. Um, and then you probably want to ask yourself how many people are needed. I doubt any, uh, or most of you anyway, have the budget to like assign one dude to every computer you have. Um, and even if you could, it probably wouldn't be the best approach. And then the last question that you need to ask yourself, even if you don't think you do, is can I safely delegate Delta configuration? Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about why this is important. But ultimately, I think most people find the situation where there is somebody that needs to own some config, uh, and you want to be able to do that without you know, scaring yourself. So once you've asked these questions and you have some idea of where it is you want to get to and what sort of scale it is that you need, you need a goal. And so at Facebook, we came up with a goal. And the goal was we wanted four people to be able to manage at least tens of thousands of systems and further, we wanted service owners to be able to own their own configurations and their own relevant settings. And what do I mean by service owners? Well, at Facebook, it's really common for engineers to own their own environment until such time as their product becomes mature enough or big enough to uh, warrant having a more operationally oriented uh, engineering team associated with it. And so whether you have one of those operation teams, we call them production engineering, or you're just a bunch of software engineers who are all having to maintain the system, the reality of it is we want to give you the ability to manage the things you care about. And now that we have a goal, what do we need to achieve that goal? Well, there's three things we need. And the first one of them is some scalable building blocks. You all remember kindergarten where you had building blocks. So those scalable building blocks, the first one is distribu distribution. Your tool has to be distributed. Um, and the reason is because, I mean, it may be obvious to, to some of you, but, but if you don't have a distributed tool, then as you scale your web app, or your, whether it's your LAMP stack or whatever, or if you're in internal IT and you're scaling your email server, your DNS server, it doesn't matter what it is that you're running. As you scale your environment, if your tool is not distributed, then you now have to go scale this other thing that's off to the side. And now you have two problems to manage, and two problems is worse than one problem. If, on the other hand, your tool is distributed, then as you scale your environment, you're inherently scaling your configuration management system. That's way better. So 
We also wanted a deterministic system. When I run my configuration management system, regardless of whatever tool I pick, when it's done running, if it ex exits successfully, I need to have the, the system I expect. It should be totally ready to do whatever it is I need it to do. Eventual consistency is not acceptable here. I don't want to have to run the tool twice, or three times, or five times, or 10 times, or try and guess if the system's configured. An exit success on my configuration management system should mean that we're good to go. It's got to be idempotent, um, so only the necessary changes. Um, if I, I should be safe to run this tool over and over again, uh, and it should not try and say restart SSH every time it runs just because I told it I want SSH running. It's got to be extensible. Uh, I've got to be able to tie it into internal systems. And while at Facebook we're a big company and have lots of internal systems, uh, I've worked at many dot coms, and every single one of them had something I would classify as an internal system, whether that was a group of flat files, um, an Excel spreadsheet, a MySQL database, it doesn't matter. Somewhere out there, you have something that has data in it that you want to leverage. Um, and so the ability to tie your configuration management system into whatever internal tools you have is going to be really important. And finally, it's got to be flexible. Um, you have a workflow that works for your company, whatever it is. At Facebook, our workflow involves uh, working off of head, having uh, code reviews before we commit, pushing code twice a day, all of these things that make Facebook uh, work the way it does. And each one of you has a workflow. And, and you don't want a tool that's going to gonna break this workflow. The second thing we need is configuration is data. And, and that's this interesting fuzzy term that you may have heard or you may not have heard. And what do I mean by that? Well. If I'm one of these service owners, these engineers, I may know things like, I need to configure this DSR VIP, or I would like to my, my core files to be in the special place where I'm going to process them, or I need to make sure that I don't do NSCD caching for hosts entries, or whatever. But what I don't know as a service owner, or at least I may not know, is how to do those things. How do I configure DSR VIPs? How do I uh, configure all my syscontrol settings? Or better yet, just because I know I want to remove core, fi remove core files, it doesn't necessarily mean I know about TCP memory settings elsewhere in that syscontrol file. I don't know what LDAP server my machine should talk to so that I can log in and all of that sort of stuff. So what we wanted here was for people to be able to express the things that they do know using hashes and arrays and, and common data. Here's a list of things I need. Here's a hash of associations that I need. And then we would take that, we would merge that into larger data sets, and we would be able to use that to configure the system. And finally, we needed flexibility. We've already talked about uh, having a tool that adapts to our workflow, so I'll skip that one. But we needed super fast prototyping. It's a common joke in our industry that people come to us and say, oh, I need this thing, and I need, I need this change in the environment. Oh, OK, well, when do you need that? I need it uh, now, um, or I need it yesterday. And joke as that may be, the reality of it is we've all heard it. Uh, and at Facebook, because we move so fast, it actually happens pretty regularly that somebody needs something across the entire fleet you know, by lunch. Uh, and so even if you're in an environment where those sorts of demands aren't on your time, the faster you can prototype something, the faster you can test it, and the faster you can be, have it ready to be pushed out, the faster you can move on to whatever the hell you were doing before that. Um, we wanted a tool where assumptions, the internal assumptions of that tool could be changed easily. Obviously, if you're going to go find a tool uh, to, for your company, you're going to try and find one that maps, give or take, to the way you want to do things. And no, none of them is going to be perfect. You're going to run into a case where this tool just doesn't, doesn't quite map to the way you want to do things. And the bigger you are, the more interesting one-offs you have in your environment, um, the harder this is going to be. So we wanted a tool where when we hit that wall, we would be able to work around it easily. And finally, we wanted a tool that could be extended in new ways. I'm going to come up with features that I want that you know I don't want to have to wait for the vendor to go and, and add a feature. I don't want to have to hack the feature, rebuild the RPM, all of that garbage. I just want to be able to add features easily. So I'm going to give an example. It does not cover everything on that last slide, but I want to give an example of what I mean by the kind of flexible workflow we're looking for. So let's say I want to templatize syscontrol.conf. Um, and then I want to build a hash that does some basic math and figures out, based on hardware that I'm running on, what the most probably sane defaults are for every syscontrol that I could possibly care about. I then want to give everyone else in the company who has some say over any given box the ability to run a little bit of code that can change this hash. It's just a hash. Key equals value. Syscontrol equals value. And they should be able to assign into that hash or delete entries from that hash or modify entries in that hash. And at the very end of that, um, this template should run, should take this hash, and should write out the results. 
really simple, super flexible. That's kind of what we're looking for. So having this idea of where we wanted to go, what we needed, what our goals were, it was time to pick a tool. And we looked at a lot of tools. We did a first blush pass at anything you could possibly imagine. And we narrowed it down to three uh, contenders that seemed like they would probably meet our needs. Spine, the, the tool I co-wrote at Ticketmaster, um, Puppet, who I'm sure you're all familiar with, and Chef. And uh, to cut a long story short, we picked Chef. And I'm, I'm going to talk about a problem we picked with Chef and the reason uh, we faced with Chef. And the reason I'm going to do that is because if I pick any one of you in the audience and I say, hey, man, what's your favorite editor? And you're like, dude, Vim, Vim's ro Vim rocks. I go, OK, well, what do you like about Vim? You will we'll go and talk for an hour. Um, and I don't want to sit here and talk for an hour about why I like Chef. I want to give you an idea of the problems we faced with it and how we dealt with it, because I think it gives a, a, a better picture. So for us, the, one of the first problems we faced was the node save problem. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with Chef, node save is this thing that happens at the very end of a run where it takes all of the data that it, that it introspected about the machine, your file systems and your routes and your network interfaces and your users and all of this stuff, along with all the information about the run itself, what, was, uh, what cookbooks ran, uh, how many resources changed, how long it took, all of this stuff. It takes this big object and it saves it to the server. And in most companies, what you now have is you magically now have an inventory management system. You're like, dude, magical inventory management system. Awesome. Um, at Facebook, we have an inventory management system, so we didn't really need this feature. But moreover, uh, we have really big clusters, like 10 plus thousand node clusters. And if you have, say, 15,000 machines on a network, and they're all going to run Chef every 15 minutes, and they're all going to take this like, multi-megabyte object and shove it over the network, uh, you're going to melt your switches. And I don't really want to melt my switches. And even if I wasn't going to melt my switches, I have to save some bandwidth for all of those likes and pictures of cats. So um, we looked at how we were going to solve this problem. And I looked at the community, and we asked a couple questions. And, and there was a lot of solutions. And they all came down to the same thing, which was disable Ohai plugins. And Ohai is this thing that runs at the very beginning of a chef run to do introspection to the machine. For those of you familiar with, with Puppet, it's the same thing as Factor. So, that just seemed sucky to me. I don't want to disable these plugins. I want that data. I want to know what file systems are on my machine. I want to know what routes I have. I want to know what addresses I have. I just don't want to send it up to the server. So we sat down with Adam Jacob, the guy who wrote the original version of Chef, and we came up with a solution. Um, and that solution went through about three or four iterations before it actually worked. And what we found was, or what we ended up on, was this cookbook called Whitelist Node Adders. You can go download it. Uh, and what it does is it reopens the node save method internal to Chef from a cookbook. We didn't change the code base itself. It walks through the internal hashes inside the node object, deletes everything that's not whitelisted, and then calls the original node.save. And of course, if we have a whitelist, it needs to be configurable, so it's just a, um, an attribute on the node that any cookbook can access. So I don't want to get too into code here, but I'm going to put the code up on the, uh, on the screen here really quickly to point out that essentially what we have here is five lines of code that fundamentally change this assumption of the tool. And I'm cheating slightly, because the, fu the filter function's not up there. It's another 15, 20 lines of code. Um, but essentially, we open this function. We take the four hashes that are internal to the node object. We pass them to this filter thing. We reassign them back. We call node.save. And I think we can all agree here that, damn, that is flexible. Uh, I should point out here <laughs> that I'm not advocating we monkey patch our tool every time we need to, uh, we need to deploy a new app. Right? That would be horrible. Um, on the other hand, when you hit a wall, when you need to change an assumption of a tool, the ability to do this is, um, is, is priceless. And in fact, we did this two or three times. So that said, let's look at a little bit about the workflow that we designed within Chef. Uh, we wanted to provide an API for anyone anywhere, and by anyone, I mean these service owners, to extend their own configuration by munging data structures, whether that be hashes or arrays, essentially just data structures. We wanted engineers to not have to know what they were building on. So if I want to add an IP address to a host, I shouldn't have to know what other IP addresses it already had. I shouldn't have to know anything else about the network stack. I just know that I need this IP address. Excuse me. We wanted engineers to be able to change their tiers without worry about changing any other tier. If I'm responsible for the web tier, I should be able to change things on the web tier and not worry about breaking the databases and vice versa. Testing had to be easy. CF Engine World, uh, which is where we were before we used CF Engine 2, testing was horrible. Uh, and there was many cases you just physically couldn't test. Um, and then the ones that you could test, it was with chatter, it was ugly, it was horrible. So testing has to be easy. If testing is not easy, people don't test. If you would force people to test and testing is not easy, people don't do work. Both of those situations suck. 
There's one other thing we needed. <clears throat> and this is where this talk will diverge from pretty much every other configuration management talk you will see. Uh, it's also where we diverge mostly from how most people run Chef um, or any other configuration management system. There's not a word for this. There's not a, there, this has never been named before, as far as I know. So I had to make one up. And I'm sorry, but I suck at names. So I call it moving item potency up. So what do I mean by that? Well, most configuration management systems today deal with records, a syscontrol entry, a cron entry, a user. Uh, and so what happens is you add some code into your configuration management system that says, hey, add this cron. And if later you decide I don't want this cron, and you were to delete those lines from your cookbook or your, your puppet manifest or whatever, then, then it doesn't know about that cron job anymore, and it just sits stale. Compare this to a item potent system where your configuration management system is going to manage the entirety of cron, the entirety of syscontrol, the entirety of my password file, whatever. The idea there is that when all of a sudden there's an entry I don't recognize, I can just delete it. So I get cleanup for free. So what does this look like? Well, this is the current state of the world. And I know that's probably hard to see um, somewhere in the audience. But uh, so here's a made up cron job and a made up uh, user that I have added. Um, and I used our uh, internal code review system called Fabricator. It's open source as well to sort of show diffs. Um, and what happens here is the default action in Chef is, is create. So you go, OK, action delete. I need to delete these things. I don't want them anymore. And then you've all seen this where you add a comment somewhere in a code base that says, hey, you can delete this after a certain date. This sucks. No one's going to clean this shit up, right? So can we do better? What we really want is to just delete the crap we don't care about and move on. How do we get there? Well, let's look at a case study of how we did this in just one area. So I'm going to look at syscontrol again. And you guys are probably going, why is he talking about syscontrol so much? Uh, in the CF Engine 2 world, we had 151 copies of syscontrol.conf. And the way that happens is some dude was like, hey, man, I need to change this setting. And uh, like, I don't want swappiness on. So I think my machine is kind of like a cache machine, so I'm going to go copy the syscontrol.conf.cache, and I'm going to change my one line. I'm going to add a rule that says copy it to my machines. And what he's done there, or she, is now add 100 plus 200, whatever, how many of ever syscontrols there are, a bunch of lines of stale configs. Because they don't know what those configs mean, and they don't care about those configs, and they're not managing those configs. They care about one line, but they've immediately made a bunch of stale configs, and that sucks. We wanted to, we wanted to solve this problem. So we wrote this cookbook, FP Syscontrol. And in the attributes file, which is, for those of you who don't know Chef, where you define sort of default data for your cookbook, uh, we, we wrote some code that would look at the hardware and look at some basic things about the machine and build a hash of syscontrols that was probably the right thing for most of Facebook. Then in our recipe, which is where you define what you're going to, to manage, we said, hey, Etsy syscontrol.conf is a thing you manage. You're going to manage it with this template. And then we have the, the template there. Um, and off screen, uh, we also tell Chef that if you update it, you have to run syscontrol minus p, but that's sort, of not, that's sort of tangential. So what does it look like? Here's our template. It's three lines. And for those of you who don't know Ruby or ERB very well, uh, basically we're just taking this hash, uh, we're looping over it, we're sorting the keys, and we're printing out key space equals space value. That's it. And you can see in the bottom there that it looks like a syscontrol.com file, and in fact it is. And if you're saying, well, I mean, I see why that works, Phil, but also why is that sexy? Here's why it's sexy. The DBAs come along, and they're like, hey, I need to run the database cookbook on, on our machines. And here's two lines that says, by the way, we need more shared memory for MySQL. And that's awesome, because they don't have to know about any other syscontrol. They don't make any stale entries. I don't have to know what their syscontrol entries are, because I don't know anything about MySQL tuning. I know how to manage systems. And they know how to manage shared memory settings for MySQL. And so they get to manage their bits, and I get to manage my bits. And so how does this help us scale? Well. Um, we get significantly he better heterogeneous scale because we're only ever expressing the divergence from the norm. And that saves us a ton of configuration, a ton of data, and a ton of manpower. We also have fewer people that need to manage these configs because everyone has to know less things. So the DBA team no longer has to be a systems expert, and I no longer have to be a MySQL expert. Everyone can focus on what they do best, and so those teams can be smaller. And then finally, delegation is simple. It's a variable assignment. Everyone here can do a variable assignment. So some other examples of APIs we've provided. Uh, we have a want IBV6 um, API. I want you to run through these really quickly. If you set it to false, it uh, blacklists IPv6 modules. You get no IPv6. If you set it to true, we configure all the IPv6 magic. 
If you need to know if you're in one of our layer three clusters versus our layer two clusters, uh, there's, a, there's a function that'll return true or false. Um, and then if you want a cron job, you add an entry to a hash. If you don't want that cron job anymore, you delete it. And then my favorite example, DSR VIPs. Not all of you will be familiar with this, um, unless you work at a relatively large web shop. But DSR VIPs are, are called direct server return. And the idea is, is I can route all of my requests through my load balancer, but have all my responses go directly to the client. And since responses are much larger, typically speaking, than requests, you save a lot of money in load balancers. Cool, awesome, sounds great, except for it's really a huge pain to configure. Um, you have to have special interfaces on all your backends, and you have to have special routing configurations and all this stuff. If it's layer two versus layer, if, you, if you're layer two adjacent to your load balancers, you do it one way. If you're not, you do it another way. If it's v4, you do it one way. If it's v6, you do it another way. So if you wanted to add a DSR VIP at Facebook, you might potentially end up adding 20, 30 files um, to the repo, plus a bunch of god-awful CF Engine copy rules. It was bad. So we fixed it. And Chef, it's function call. Hey, dude, here's an IP address. Make it work. We'll figure out all of the bits and pieces. So now you have an idea of kind of how we designed um, the configuration piece and the APIs. Let's look a little bit about our Chef infrastructure itself. How am I doing on time? We're good. So uh, time for a disclaimer. We use both open source Chef and private Chef, um, which is what those two acronyms stand for, um, open source Chef and or ops code open source Chef and ops code private Chef. So um, we use both. And it was really important to us when we sat down to, to pick a tool that whatever we dealt with would be something that scaled incredibly well that we could share with the community. We didn't want to sit here and be like, hey, man, this really, really works if you spend a bunch of money. We wanted to, to, give some, to talk about something that the entire community could share. So it was really important to us that Open Source Chef um, would be something we could run production clusters on, and we do. We also bought a license to Private Chef so that we'd get early access to new features, uh, as well as um, we use some of the Private Chef features for our testing infrastructure. Um, but we do have full production clusters that run Open Source Chef, and, and uh, you can totally use Open Source Chef for Facebook, style, Facebook scale clusters. We made a few customizations. We assume our, uh, we treat our Chef servers as stateless. Um, so that means we don't use search. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with Chef, you'll notice that because we use whitelist node adders, the thing I mentioned earlier, you couldn't really use search anyway. There's no data there to search. We don't use data bags for similar reasons, which are just sort of key value pairs you can shove on the server. We have separate failure domains. We have lots of clusters. Each one of our clusters has a Chef infrastructure. Uh, and so losing one Chef infrastructure only affects that cluster. And finally, we use what Private Chef calls the tiered model, which means that we have some state, stateless front ends that have zero data on them. And then we have back ends, which are what uh, typically would have stateful data, although we have very little stateful data. Um, and that helps us scale a little bit. You can do this in Open Source Chef. Uh, it works just as well, but the config file is a bit longer. So what does our environment look like? Well, at a global level, you have, a, you have somebody who writes some cookbooks, some roles, whatever, and they get them code reviewed. You cannot commit at Facebook without a code review. So someone reviews your code, says it's good. That usually involves you having to prove that you tested it. And then we lint. In our environment, we use Food Critic for chef correctness linting uh, and Taylor for Ruby correctness or Ruby style linting. And once you've passed all of that, you can commit to our subversion repos. And for those of you who just got a little sick to your stomach, don't worry, we wrap it with Git. And uh, as soon as you commit to subversion, uh, all of our clusters now pull that data. So let's zoom into one of those clusters and figure out how that happens. So this is one of those cluster boxes. Every backend maintains its own stuff. It is completely independent. So we have two backends behind a load balancer. They're active, stand, uh, active passive, so standby. Um, and each one runs a little piece of software called Grocery Delivery, which we've open sourced, which basically keeps track of what's happening in Subversion. And then any cookbooks that are added or modified get uploaded. Any ones that were deleted get removed. Um, same thing with roles. And so, for example, if a backend falls off the network for 10 minutes, it doesn't matter. When it comes back up, it'll catch up. So we don't ever have to worry about how to keep all of our BEs in sync. They're just done. And if we need to fail over, both of them have all of our data. Then we have three stateless front ends. Um, and those just are all three active behind the load balancer. Very simple. It's just web traffic, uh, HTTPS traffic. And then all of our web servers and our cache servers and our database servers, they all talk to their local chef FIP, one in every cluster. So based on all of this, we make some assumptions. As I said, we assume our server is essentially stateless. So no data is not persistent. For those of you who use Chef, you notice that if you shove data in the node object, it persists. Um, that is not true in our environment. 
um, because of whitelist node adders. We don't use data bags, as I said. Uh, grocery delivery keeps rolls and cookbooks in sync, and Chef only knows about the cluster it's in. So some implementation details. Uh, the work turns out that we exist in uh, time, uh, and that data kind of sort of has to be persistent. Uh, so how do we solve that problem? Well, we have internal systems of record at Facebook that track information about a system, like what cluster it's in, um, what kind of cluster that is, what its IP address is, et cetera. And we also have a grouping system, which takes all of our machines, puts them in groups, puts those groups in groups, and so on and so forth. And we need that data. Uh, so what we did was we wrote some OHI plugins, and again, OHI is the thing that runs at the beginning of a chef run to do introspection uh, and provide information about the system, which pulls, so we wrote some plugins that pulls that information and makes it available to the run. Um, and then we force the run list uh, on every run from the client. That's the other thing that you would store typically on the server. Every client has a file that defines its run list, and it says, hey, here's what I need. Now the, st the st server is essentially stateless. Um, on the client, we have a report handler that takes all sorts of data and feeds it into our central monitoring system, last exception seen, um, success failure run, number of resources, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's fairly Facebook specific at this point, um, although I am interested in trying to figure out how we could release that. But on the topic of releasing things, on the server side, we've been able to release much more stuff. We have Chef Server stats uh, that will gather all sorts of monitoring and statistics information from either an open source or a private Chef Server handles them both seamlessly, um, and all sorts of stats, and dumps out a uh, JSON object. And then you can feed that into any monitoring system you can imagine. And then, uh, as I said, grocery delivery is open source, so we put all of our stuff on that GitHub repo. And which leads us to the question that everyone that wants to ask, which is, but Phil, does it scale? Well, I can answer that question, but first we need to talk about what we mean by scale at Facebook. Our cluster sizes tend to be around 10,000 nodes. Some of them are a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, but 10,000 is, is a reasonable average. We run Chef every 15 minutes out of cron, uh, and we have a 14-minute splay, and grocery delivery runs every minute in cron. And so what that actually adds up to is the fact that we have the Domino's pizza delivery uh, guarantee, right? All of your configs are in the world when 30 minutes or less. We also have lots of clusters. And what do I mean by lots of clusters? Well, I can't give you an exact number. Uh, but what I will say is that we have lots of clusters in a data center, lots of data centers in a region, and multiple regions. So a lot. Big number. So um, in back in December, uh, Open Source Chef 11 landed uh, with the rewrite from all of their API endpoints on the Ruby server to the to the Erlang server, and uh, we were pretty excited. We'd worked with OpsCode a lot on this release, on, on testing early versions and on input on, on how that should go. And so this code drops, and I install it, and it's running, and that's cool. And I thought, well, let's see what this thing can do. So I decided I wanted to throw two clusters at it. And so if you look on the left-hand side of this graph, what you'll see is a red line, which is the CPU idle on the active backend and a blue line, which is the number of nodes. And so on the left-hand side of this graph, we have one cluster. It's sort of steady state. And then I deleted all the nodes, and I took two load balancers, and I pointed, them, um, pointed both VIPs at the same chef infrastructure, the same open source chef infrastructure. And so we, we spike up to over about half an hour. We get to 17,000 nodes. And you can see that our CPU idle during that registration crunch only dropped down to about 67%. And then you had a bunch of synchronization and stuff, and it, it goes down to like 63% and comes back up. And the data sampled here, so what you can't actually see all that clearly is that um, once that was all done, it actually leveled out at about 80% for uh, quite a while before we called the experiment a success. Um, and so basically what that means is this thing can sit at around 80% CPU idle and handle 17,000 nodes checking in every 15 minutes and doing their chef runs. And we thought that was pretty impressive. So that was cool. But let's go back in time a little bit more to, to look at exactly what this means. So um, before this all made it into Open Source Chef, we, uh, we were using Private Chef. And what they had done was uh, they had taken the three busiest API endpoints on the server, and they had rewritten them in Erlang. And the idea was to move them all over, but you know, one, one step at a time. And so we were using this Private Chef uh, server that had these three endpoints in Erlang. And we thought that should get us through uh, until, until this open source chef release comes out. And uh, so we wrote all our cookbooks. We spent months doing this. And we start moving machines. We move one, and then 10, and then 100. And I get to the point where I'm pretty comfortable with this. So I'm adding 700 at a time. So I dump 700 machines off of CF Engine 2 and onto Chef. I'm like, cool, that works. Dump another 700. Cool, that works. And then I notice something. Uh, 
every time I add 700 more nodes, I lose more CPU idle than I did in the last chunk of 700. And that kind of scares me. So we get to about 4,000 nodes. My active back end is at 50% CPU idle. And I'm like, uh-oh, I got a lot more nodes to go. So I call Adam. Uh, and I'm like, dude, this, this thing isn't working. And he says, let me call you back. He calls me back. And he goes, so, and I swear to God he said this to me, we can probably put some more thrust on that pig. And I said, Adam says stuff like that. If you haven't had a chance to meet him, go talk to him. He's awesome. So I said, OK. And he said, well, but I have a better idea. Uh, we finally finished this rewrite onto Erlang. Um, I can probably deliver you a, a build of that in the next week. I said, so you, you rewrote the whole server, all the API server anyway. And he's like, yeah, in Erlang, yeah. Are you using that in Hosted Chef? Nope. Are any of your customers using it? No. Has anyone ever put this in production? Nope. Huh. Eh, we're Facebook. Fuck it. Let's do it. So we did. And here's what happened. Uh, and the left-hand side of this graph, same color scheme here. So red is uh, CPU idle of the active backend. Blue is the number of nodes. And this was, uh, was 4,000 nodes, as I said. We hadn't done a whole cluster yet. And green is the, the standby backend, which we, we chose not to upgrade in the event we needed uh, to fall back. So you can see about halfway through this graph, a little less than halfway through this graph, we do the upgrade. Data goes away briefly. And when it comes back, we see something we don't expect. The CPU idle of the active backend is higher than the one of the standby backend, even though it's got 4,000 nodes reporting to it. And we thought, that's not right. Something's wrong. So we spent a whole bunch of time going, OK, well, let's, let's make some changes in Chef and see if they push out. Chef runs can't possibly be succeeding. And they were. Well, with that out of the way, the, sh the reporting had to be wrong. So we did a bunch of work to try and figure out where, why are we reporting the, the data wrong, and we weren't. It turned out that the new software could run 4,000 nodes more efficiently than the old software could run zero nodes. Well, that was cool. So once we had satisfied uh, our own curiosity there, we started adding more nodes. And so you can see here that there's this graph, and it's going up. And again, it's sampled, so you can't see the stepwise function. We added about 700 nodes at a time. And what you see there is that the CPU idle drops to uh, uh, about 72% at its lowest point. And it's worth noting here that because Private Chef has a role-based access control mechanism, client creation is way more expensive than in, in Open Source Chef. So the fact that it only dropped down that low is pretty impressive. And then now you have an extra you know, 3,000 nodes that need to go and configure all their stuff for the first time. And so that's where that second drop comes in. And then it levels out at 79% CPU idle. So the new software was using as much CPU as the old software, but it had 7,000 nodes, and the old software had zero nodes. So the answer is, yeah, it, it totally scales. I want to talk a minute about testing. Uh, at Facebook, it's true, we test in production. We needed uh, to set up a system where people could actually see what their code was going to do on a production system before they committed it. And remember that when you commit something in, in, uh, at Facebook, it immediately goes out to the entire world. So committing is, is a big responsibility, and we need to make sure that people can actually see that things are going to go the way they want them to. And this is the one place where we really heavily utilize a feature of Private Chef, which is multi-tenancy, the ability to create essentially virtual Chef servers on one Chef instance. Um, and so they're called orgs, organizations. And so you could do this in, in, in Open Source Chef, uh, but you would probably need to add a bunch more plumbing and probably use some VMs. Um, and we thought that we were paying for Private Chef, and, and this would be a really cool use of it. So the way it works is uh, you run init. And this is a little shell script wrapper that does some magic. But you run init, and it gets you a user and an org on the test, on the test servers. And then you run test minus s in some place that you want to test, some production host. And it takes your local Git repo and uploads all of the stuff to your virtual Chef server, your org. And then it logs into this box, and it says, hey, you're now going to do Chef runs from this, this other place. You log into the box. You run Chef. You're like, hey, that works. Cool. Or more likely, oh, dude, that totally blew up. That didn't work at all. Uh, so then you VI your stuff, you re-upload, you, you run, rinse and repeat until you're happy, and then in your uh, diff, you're like, hey, here's how I tested. The great thing about the way Chef Test works, though, and the thing that is so much better than the way we had things before, is that when you put a server in testing mode, you have an hour. Unless you, uh, every time you touch it, that hour goes forward. But essentially, you have an hour before it reverts back to production. So we never have that one box out there that's like doing its own crazy thing because Phil put it in test mode and then forgot to untest it. You have an hour, and it automatically reverts. So we learned some lessons here. 
uh, and I tried to, to, to uh, put those lessons in this talk, but let's summarize them. The first lesson is that idempotent systems are better than idempotent records um, when you're trying to manage heterogeneity at scale. Uh, it means that you can much better model how each system is different from your base. Um, we learned that delta configuration uh, allows for easier, uh, <coughs> sorry, delegating delta configuration allows for e easier heterogeneity. So if I can give the dude access to the configs that he cares about, and I don't have to worry about it, and, and we have more heterogeneity better. Uh, full programming languages are far better than restrictive DSLs. Uh, coming from CF Engine 2, which didn't even have like loops, um, you get pretty frustrated. Um, so having you know the full power of a programming, programming language, in this case Ruby, but it doesn't really matter, any programming language uh, is really useful. Scale is more than just the number of clients. This is really important. People talk about scale purely in how many clients can connect to my configuration management system. Um, but the reality of it is that's probably not the biggest concern you have. The biggest concern I think any of us have is how many people does it take? I can buy a server. A server is a couple thousand dollars. You can buy lots of them. But your salary is more important, right? Like that's a bigger number and it's a recurring number. Um, and people are hard. Good people are hard to find. So the number of people it actually takes to grok these configs and to manage this system is really important. Um, and so the number of systems that can connect is important, but it's just a small factor. Easy abstractions are critical. Uh, look at the add, add DSR vip function we did. That abstracted probably 20 minutes of having to dig through configs and try to understand the state of the system before you could add a vip that we abstracted out in a function call. Um, testing systems in, uh, in production is useful and necessary, and I am in no way advocating that this should be the only tests that you have and do. Um, you probably, if you work at a bank, for example, it's probably not the first test you should run. Um, however, after you do all the other tests that you deem necessary, the reality of it is that if you don't test in production, you have no idea what that code's going to do when you unleash it. So in summary, uh, we looked at these four different questions that we wanted to ask ourselves in the beginning. You may remember them. So what did w we designed a system, and, and how does that system measure up to these, these questions? Well, we didn't need all of these, but the point here is that you need to figure out what it is you need and then how the system you're going to build measures up to that. So let's do that. How many homogenous systems can we maintain? Well, we looked at a system where we were throwing 17,000 nodes that needed a lot of dynamic, heterogeneous configuration at a server and it had way, way more CPU to go. And since homogeneous systems are usually than heterogeneous systems, we can do even better than that. So we don't know an exact number, but way over the 17,000 point. And because we use heterogeneous systems to come up with the homogeneous systems number, we already know what that number, more than 17,000 nodes. How many people are needed? My team that built this is four people. Um, it has not always been the same four people, but it has never been more than four people. And at times, it has been far less than four people, um, like a half a person. So ultimately, four people. Uh, and can you safely delegate delta configuration? Assuming anyone in who you might want to delegate configuration to can do a variable assignment, then yes, we have super easy um, delta configuration uh, delegation. I want to thank a few people. Uh, OpsCode has been an incredible partner during this. Um, in particular, Adam Jacob and Chris Brown, Stephen Dana, and the Air Chef team have been amazing. Uh, Andrew Crump, who wrote Food Critic. Uh, if you're using Chef, you absolutely should use Food Critic. It is, uh, um, open source software that does correctness testing for Chef, um, and we enforce it on pre-commit. I can't imagine delegating that level of, of, of configuration to other people without some sort of correctness testing. Uh, and then everyone I, I work with or have worked with on my team, Aaron, Bethany, Casey, um, David, Larry, um, Pedro, and Tyler. And uh, that is all I got. <laughs> if anyone has questions, I apparently have a few minutes. Yeah. Sure. So the question was, uh, what's the ratio of clusters you manage to actual chef instances? We have one chef instance per cluster because we want separate failure domains. So we have five boxes in every cluster that run chef, two back ends and three front ends. Um, I have pointed 
two clusters at one just for testing purposes. Based on the numbers, if I had to guess, I would say I could probably do 10-ish of our clusters, which is probably going to be more than, than you could possibly want. Um, we don't actually use multi-tenancy in production um, because, again, we use open source chef in a lot of our clusters, which doesn't have multi-tenancy. Um, and so the, so the reality there is every uh, cluster has one chef instance, which is one org and, and one environment. Um, and as I said, those clusters are uh, give or take around 10,000 nodes. They, they spike up and down, but give or take 10,000 nodes. And they check in every 15 minutes. Other questions? I think I'm supposed to go now. The red light's beeping at me. So uh, I'll be around. Feel free to come ask me questions.